Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the third meeting of the Dorian Valiente Foundation <laughs> Book Club, where we talk yeah. about Dorian's wonderful books. This is the second meeting where we'll be talking about her compilation of fiction entitled The Witch's Ball and Other Short Stories. We are here today with some of our friends who will be talking about some individual chapters, but we'll just kind of be looking at an overview of the book and our impressions and the feelings that we got while we read. Is there anybody who would like to go first? Are we going in any particular order? Well, we can sort of talk about in general the book. Is there any thoughts people have? But, it, it, but I don't think we are going in any particular order. I can jump in. That would be lovely. Yeah, the, the, the chapter I wanted to talk about is the chapter called A Night in Wookiee Hole. And, uh, and I'm, I was excited to talk about this uh, chapter because Wookiee Hole is a place that many moons ago I visited. And I think that um, some of the expectations I had about what I wanted Wookie Hole to be like, or what I wanted my visit there to be like, are kind of captured in this chapter. Um, you know, I wanted it to be, you know, super creepy, dark and mysterious. And that's how it's depicted uh, in most of this chapter. Um, kind of a scary place, a folk horror-ish place, a folklore-ish place. But, uh, but when I actually went there, it was more you know, family theme park kind of place. Um, but it was still fun and caves are cool. And uh, I think that that's kind of captured in this chapter. Um, so what we've got is our, our friends, Ashton and Blake getting together for an evening of each other's company and a bit of food and a bit of wine. And um, uh, our, our friend Ashton has, uh, he's the antiques dealer. And, and I, I love that, that reoccurring discussion about his, his antiques business. It really, I think I mentioned this last time we were together, it really reminds me of something that must have been in the air. You know, you've got um, Dion Fortune and Sea Priestess talks about, you know, antiquities and, and old stuff that gets, you know, recycled into the Sea Priestess's home. You know, you've got um, in real life, you know, Sybil Leak had a, a, a shop that was, uh, you know, influenced by antique sales and all this just cool, you know, recycling of antiques. It seems like a, a theme from a lot of the, the writers and of the time. So I don't know, maybe that's just me being tangential and kind of projecting my own interests, but it's, it's fun to think about. So Ashton found a bundle of papers in a secret drawer in a desk, ooh, you know, how Narnian of him to have a desk with a secret compartment that leads to this fabulous hidden story, right? Um, so the, the, the memoir that he found was written by uh, this, this uh, uh, some kind of vicar or priest or something that had in his youth been a really uh, rowdy, privileged young man. And he fell into the company of a very uh, charismatic other privileged young man who uh, led them all into sort of a hellfire club kind of situation when you know the reference to the hellfire club was kind of interesting to, to see in this story as well and uh, this group of young men go off to Wookiee Hole uh, with some ladies of loose morals apparently who you know joined them in this mission to go down into the the cave and have a orgiastic party with liquor and food and and they all dressed up in robes, you know? So it, it's kind of, you know, if I'm imagining Doreen writing this, you know, sort of projecting her own idea of a kind of fun <laughs> into this story. Um, I like to think so anyway, that's what I would do. So uh, it's fun when you read about a fictitious story about a real place and you can picture it in your mind, you know, again, took me back to Sea Priestess when, you know, places in Dion Fortune's book where she's writing about a real place and you can see it in your mind's eye. It was fun to read about this and see Wookiee Hole in my mind's eye and try and transpose the past onto that. I thought that was really fun. Um, so off they go to this cave and they have this, this great party, but the, the ringleader, uh, of the guy who instigated the party doesn't show up until he shows up as a specter uh, having been 
in a duel and murdered uh, it, it, somewhere else. But uh, I don't know, lots of fun. And I, I really uh, sort of got the hint throughout the chapter that, you know, Doreen's sort of projecting a desire for a, a, a certain type of British history into the story. You know, she writes about um, uh, Wook, the cave at Wookie Hold, you know, talking about how it resembles, uh, you know, these old ancient places. And she likens the, the stalactite formation that is known as the Witch of Wookie Hole. Uh, she likens it to a statue of that dark goddess whom the ancient Romans called Cybele or the Magna Mater. And uh, I've seen that stalactite, that's kind of grandiose, but it's, uh, it's fun to think. And it's fun to think about, um, you know, th looking through witchcraft eyes at these things and, and projecting these sort of fun desires and ancient desires on them. Um, it's a really fun story and it's got that folk horror element, you know, and, and this whole supernatural overlay. And uh, anyway, as a result of his uh, experience at Wookiee Hole that night, the writer of this memoir um, is repentant and joins the priesthood and devotes his life to God. So whatever it was that happened to him, it was, it, you know, inside was incredibly uh, profound, but it was interesting, you know, imagining as a witch writing about somebody becoming so Christian and, and you know, repentant and pious. So that was kind of interesting. Um, the other thing that I, I, I was really intrigued by is when um, Ashton and Blake sit down to read this memoir, they, uh, uh, Ashton uh, decides to omit the opening piece of the memoir because he, it's, it's much like a sermon. And I found myself all the way through going, I wonder what he said. I wonder what he said. And I had felt I'd fallen for the story to the point where I, for a moment there, had to give my head a shake and go, Dodie, it's only a story. There was no, there is no document to refer to here. So I kind of wondered, I wonder if Doreen was, you know, referring to something that she had once read or something that somebody had once told her about. So anyway, that, that's, that's my thoughts on A Night in Wookiee Hole made me really want to go back there too. We have a, um, a, a place we go to every year in the spring and again in the fall to celebrate and it's very close to a set of caves. This is in Kentucky so not really near where I live at all but it always feels magical when I go into those caves. Um, and it does feel a little bit of like a theme park because there are railings and, you know, people are, care you know, carefully, but it's at a park, so it is kind of hidden and secret and there's something about going into the ground and those stalactites and stalagmites always feels sort of wondrous. Uh, here on the Canadian Prairie, we do not have caves. So when I am in a landscape that has caves, I get extremely excited. And, you know, Wookiee Hole I had to see because it was a cave and going to Cheddar Gorge was a big deal. because There's some fantastic caves there and in the Peak District as well. There's some of the going to Blue John Mine and crawling around in there, you know, they're safe. There's electrical lighting and stairs and handrails, like you say, but it's uh, something about that is really exotic and mysterious. The, the ability to do a, a party or any kind of a celebration in a cave like that seems improbable to me, but I think um, the idea of it is very appealing. Yes. Are there well, actually caves like that in the UK where you can go and do things like that? I am not... Um... I'm not local enough yet to know if where the caves are. I'll probably find out at some point. Um, but I was thinking, speaking about caves, I was thinking that, uh, well, where I have got my excavations in Italy, um, that's a karstic area. And so there are caves and, and, and they have been used for rituals um, since 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 the prehistory and since, since the Neo Neolithic. I think for us, uh, for for us pagans, for us witches, it's very 
it's very important, the concept of the cave, because it brings us directly back to those times where religions really were forming. And it's amazing to think that the way we feel inside a cave must have been very similar to the way our ancestors felt somehow, even yeah. if we've got lights, telephones. Well, a telephone doesn't work in, in the underground, so you're cut off. Uh, and the light might not work because the battery gets lower and and so you need you need a fire it's it's very it's very interesting i think caves are very powerful and they are so powerful i would love to add this to to the conversation um the the concept of the cave as the house of gods and goddesses um it's so powerful that it was difficult to abandon it and for example, in my site, which is um, late Bronze Age, um, you can see that there is a little passage from using real caves uh, for rituals to build fake caves in the settlement. Hmm. So they, it's very interesting. They excavate, because the, the settlement is on a rock, they excavated uh, caves in the stone and they put there the date is because you know a date he couldn't leave yet just yet in a in a house in a in a timber building and then a few centuries later they started to build the hot temples and things like that so the cave is is such a powerful such a powerful symbol and i love that doreen always refers to antiquity all the time yes and and she always comes up with a particular set of uh, connection points. She'll point to, in this chapter, some specific deities. She mm. mentions Hecate, and she mentions Caridwen, and she mentions um, certain publications and things like that. And I always feel like she is giving those very intentionally. Um, and uh, whatever was going on for her at that moment when she wrote this chapter, it's like a little touch point. It's a way for us to be connected to her and the things that were important to her as an inspiration for this chapter. There's a, a mention of a, an 1865 essays, um, the Worship of Priapus. I just kind of put those into the chat so people can download them and enjoy them in all their glory. Uh, they are entertaining at the very least. And you said, Dodi, I'm very curious that the, um, the mention of this particular stalagmite as described in the, the chapter is maybe a little overblown. What did you remember about that? Well, what I remember when I visited, because you know, here, I think I was gonna find, I think it was on page 68, she says, um, I realized that it was a gigantic stalagmite formed upon the floor of the cave by the action of dripping water throughout what must have been thousands of years. In shape, it roughly re resembled a statue of that dark goddess whom the ancient Romans called Cybele or the Magna Mater and worshiped with orgiastic rites, heavy breasted brooding figure with the face of an old woman and the head surmounted by a kind of cap. Uh, Unlike its surrounding formations, the great stalagmite was blacked, black, colored by the soot of ancient sacrificial fires. So our guide informed us. So this is the kind of image I had in, in my head, you know, that it would be very much like a dark goddess, like it was, you know, it was different from the other stalagmites. So I had all this in my head walking into the theme park that was Wookie Hole. And what I, the reality I discovered is you kind of had to squint to see it that way, right? Like you really, it, it, it was, uh, and they, they had it, the other disappointing thing was that uh, when I went there, it was lit. So it intentionally looked more sensational, mm. you know? And, and it wasn't that great. You know, they had some like weird green light playing behind it so that it would, you could really see the silhouette. And it, if you squinted, it, it, you know what it reminded me of? You know that uh, Bugs Bunny witch that that tries to from the Hansel and Gretel Bugs Bunny. 
you know, with her hairpins flying behind her when she runs around. The, the stalagmite, when I very first laid eyes on it, the silhouette of it reminded me more of her than anything else, right? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Witch Hazel, the what a Witch Hazel, yes. I always find it fascinating to know what connection points people have to um, witches in both in antiquity and also in contemporary literature. Because the things that kind of uh, inspire us as children in mythology and stories, they stay with us. Even sure. Bugs Bunny, you know, <laughs> that's wonderful. Classical music and, you know, was another thing that Bugs Bunny influenced in a lot of us, right? But um, that's, it was, it was kind of, uh, it was a little bit too camp when I was there, you know? But um, I'm glad I went and I would go back, absolutely, you know, um, the fun of being in a cave. But, you know, when I think also about how those caves are, are made accessible as tourist attractions, you know, I wonder what it would have been like in prehistory. You know, I think of how um, cave paintings are found. And sometimes the cave paintings are found in really complicated, you know, Ms. Maze kind of places. And, and how did the artist get up there into the dark, into this like bizarre spot in a cave? And, you know, you know, maybe the cave changed since the painting was made. But why the hell was somebody going in there? What made it so important to, to do that there on that piece of rock wall? You know, I, I always find that really fascinating to think about. You know, it's so funny that you say that, Dodi, because I was just thinking as I was reading this chapter about the, the documentary, um, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams where right. much people go into the caves and, and a lot of things that people can't see anymore. And the way that that particular documentary was filmed, you can see it in 3D if you have the right kind of DVD player. Um, I don't see in 3D because I only have one working eye, but I love the idea that my <laughs> the kids might be able to do that. So uh, I post a, a link to that as well. Um, my my hope is that someday I could watch that with people who can see it and then they can then reflect on it. I think caves can be really scary. Certainly in this chapter, they are represented as really scary. And yeah. this connection to the, the crossroads and the dead is kind of evocative. And I wonder, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying about this theme park atmosphere. I wonder if that's a... Um, a a way for people to make it less scary, to be able to approach something this intense and to still have the experience and yet to, I don't wanna say dumb it down, but to make it um, a, little, a little less intimidating for people who are seeking out the cave. And unfortunate too, I mean, I would rather have the scary also. <laughs> well, many years ago I went with, um a friend to uh, Castleton in the Peak District. And uh, it was really interesting. We went down into one of those Blue John mines and it was January, there were like no other tourists around. So the guy that was kind of operating the place just took my friend and I, whose name is also Julie. And we went down into the, the this cave. And when we got into the heart of this chamber, this big, big high ceilinged chamber, he said, do you wanna know what dark really looks like? And before we could answer yes or no, he turned off the light. And it was so dark, it was beyond dark. Like it was, there was an utter absence of light, yeah. right? Like even when you're in a dark room or you pull blankets over your head, there's some sense of light. When you're under the ground and there is no light, there is no light. So when I think about in this book, the, this troop of, of rowdy, you know, half drunk party goers making their way down into a cave to have a party, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a really big deal, right? Because they, like you said, Marco, you've got to, your batteries might die. Well, they would have been using torches, you know, like, like, like fiery brands to find their way around. And that's so precarious, you know? And to think about cave, people who lived in caves or worshiped in caves in history, you know, anything they did was a real commitment to being there. 
you know, yeah, it was shelter, but it was also very dangerous and mysterious. And at any moment, you know, it could, who knows, there could be a rock fall, like you don't know. So I don't know, I find it really exciting to think about. The, the lanterns that have been found in some of these caves are really, exactly as though they said, really not, how can I explain, not, not very solid, not very safe. They're literally stones with a little cup uh, carved inside. And they still found um, a little bit of a, how do you call it, a, a twig? Well, a wick. Uh, a wick, sorry, <laughs> a wick in it. So it's a very tiny object and it probably didn't give a lot of light however with that amount of light they managed to paint the cathedrals of the paleolithic it is amazing and it probably was this act of painting was not just painting but it probably was uh, an experience an experience and another thing important is be um if you put the idea of darkness and absence of light you couple it with the sounds the very particular sounds you've got in a cave which is very strange well that that is an, an entire experience um there is a i don't have a clue how you call it in english unfortunately but there is a tiny uh, little um musical instrument which it is still used by, um, it, it is still an object in some native cultures of Australia, I think, most of all. Uh, it's, it's rhomboidal, it's made of wood or, or bone. It's a tiny little plaque and it's attached to a cord. And you, ah, it's called, sorry, I know how it's called. It's called a roar, because it's, it roars. And if you use it in a cave, the sound effect it's very strange and and it would it would seem like the voice of someone coming from the depth of the cave it like the the the, the voice of the ancestors or something like that for sure the ancestors played played a role in the con in how the caves were conceived because caves were used as burials in, in not in a very nice way, like people were literally sort of um, launched in little, in holes. This is how we find them sometimes. But, uh, but why? Because they were given back to the depth of, of, of Mother Earth and that magna mater that was mentioned before, uh, even by Doreen. So... Yeah, because she talks about those unworldly noises yeah. in that chapter. And, and I'm wondering, because I don't remember, I don't remember hearing anything in a cave that couldn't be explained by my, you know, companions, you know, as them making the noise. But the acoustics in a cave are really amazing. There's, um, I have a CD somewhere around here that was recorded in the, the Cheddar Gorge cave the big the big famous cave at Cheddar Gorge and the, it's a it's a shamanic drumming cd that was recorded by uh, Howard Malpas from the warrior in the heart shamanic training group and Howard went down to the cave at Cheddar to record and the chamber he used I've been in and it's uh, it's got a like an underground pond or lake or like body of water it's I don't know how big it is because it's dark down there and there's only certain amounts of light but the acoustic, that it's a very, it seems almost intentionally built because the domed, uh, oh, you're fast, Maggie. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, this, the ceiling of this cave has got a nice dome and the acoustics are just amazing. And uh, when you're down there and you're speaking, you know, everything seems very unnatural. Like the sounds seem very unnatural. So I can't imagine using a, a, a tool like a roar an instrument like a roar in a space like that which be scary very yeah I'm, I'm i'm reflecting on the idea of um of this party in such a environment where it feels there's a sense of reverence and the i think it's very interesting because doreen says in the chapter you know, they get to the end and they think, and he, and um, she, you know, her characters say, 
Um, the reason why this ghost, this spirit was able to be called up was because of the kind of orgiastic revelry of the people. And I think, I'm always thinking in terms of, of uh, sort of opposites, this, this um, polarity, if you will, of the, um, you know, the, the action, the um, frenzied um, dancing and partying on one side is the thing that causes the spirits to appear. And without that effort, without that, um, that kind of hubris of the people doing the thing, it would not have happened. And I think that's very interesting. One of the things I wondered about was that um, Sir Edward, the, the, the ringleader that instigated the party who later died, he had every, all the men dress in, in robes, sort of a mock, in mockery of monks, it, I think it's mentioned, you know, it, it looked like that to, to the writer of the story. So it, it almost felt like he was setting it up. You know, he didn't know, maybe he didn't know he was going to die, but he was setting up a scene that nobody would forget. He was raising energy already by creating that motif for the party. And, you know, as a result, sort of created an opportunity to visit them beyond, from beyond the grave kind of thing. You know, it's uh, that I thought that detail about the, 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 the robes that the, the men were wearing was, was kind of uh, interesting. It felt kind of gratuitous, but not really, you know, like they didn't need to do that, but they kind of did because it added to the uh, ritual atmosphere of the thing. Yeah, this Hellfire Club um, kind of overboard. <laughs> uh, but yeah, absolutely. This experience of invoking powers that you don't really get and you're going a little too far. And yep, yep you kind of got what he asked for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a lot of that in these stories, don't you think? Like, oh, the theme of many of them is. Uh, people may be making the wrong sort of choices at the right sort of times and things happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, there's so much to be uh, appreciated here. I love this story inside a story, that nested story theme, the way that she handles it uh, in each of these chapters too. It's, um, it's very Arabian Nights of her. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dodi, for, for sharing that with us. And your reflection on going to the caves. Now I'm inspired, even if it is just a big party there. <laughs> well, you know, it's that it's that cave piece. And and one of the things that I, I really love about um about the England is the ability to go into so many different caves. And from my like, you know. Canadian big landscape, you know, mindset, everything seems so close together to me, right? And, and you know, to be able to go and visit a bunch of caves and, you know, crawl around and, and you know, duck under rocks, it's, it's terribly exciting, so. Absolutely. I've, I've also been reading uh, a bit recently about bear cults and trying to understand bears as totemic animals. And that that also has been taking me into reading about caves a lot lately. So um, how interesting. I yeah, I find that really, I do find it really interesting, so. That came up last month for us in our, we're doing a, a year long reading of the Golden Bough um, and there's a whole chapter on, on bear cults and, uh, and I have some good links if you're interested. Well, please send them to me. That's fascinating. Yeah, on. thank you. Thank you again. Um, were there any other thoughts about this chapter? Because Marco, you're totally welcome to talk about the Talisman of the Moon. Uh, that one was was just before the fourth chapter, and that was the archaeology. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I I really enjoy this this uh, tale because um, 
because obviously the, the character is an archaeologist and although although you get archaeology everywhere in in Doreen's work <laughs> which is something very exciting to me um I really liked this this tale because I think it tells us that Doreen really knew the world of archaeologists and not just archaeology um the way she described this archaeologist it's very familiar to me i would recognize a, a scientist a researcher even if archaeology is not a perfect science it's not it's it's supported by science um by uh, we, we've got what we call archaeological science of course all the techniques to date things and to you know look under the microscope things but in reality, it's part of the humanities. It's all about interpretation. It is, in fact, in America, it's under anthropology, which is a, a difference between Europe and, and, and the States. So it is about interpretation. And uh, there is this big joke in archaeology and archaeological research about whatever you don't understand must be ritual. So everyone jokes about this. Everyone, when you find like a strange context, you know, the, the, there is the joke. Oh, is the person going to, to, to go for the ritual path or uh, will they choose another interpretation? So I, I felt that Doreen really was sort of talking, almost talking about someone she met, which could be because she was involved with the... Um, the local archaeological society so it might have been the case and then on the other side uh, I liked it because it it sort of talked to me about modern days and a very large number of witches who are also archaeologists nowadays you you start to see them um it has very, and it was probably the case in the past as well. But in the seventies, it would have been really difficult to say, "I'm a pagan" or "I'm a witch," and I am an academic. That would have been a a no go thing to say. Still, nowadays it might be difficult, but you sort of find many more people coming out as as witches, and also interested in 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 the pagan path and in Wicca. So effectively, I think it gives a perception on the talisman, the object, the artifact, which for a person like Colin, <laughs> our archeologist, is just really an object. It gives another perspective on this object. It also tells us that, hmm, it might have been a magic artifact and the context he sort of encountered excavating it might have been something more than just a, a, an occasional an occasional loss from someone it was buried on a mound so the context might have been ritual and how do we deal as witches with the ritual context with the how we with the interference with an ancient context mm. um i think it's very interesting because i think doreen is mentioning is is suggesting here that uh, somehow archaeological research might interfere with ancient energies um this is something extremely important i believe um and it is very important. I know that, um, I, don't, I don't know enough, but I know it's very important in the US. I know that luckily, luckily, archaeology is regulated in the way it interferes with uh, native contexts, which is, I would say it's great because we need, we need to fully understand what we're doing when we excavate a context. And we need to understand that we are interfering with um, a, a surviving culture. Um, I, in Europe, it's not that strong, the feeling, because obviously we very rarely have 
living cultures that deal with the monuments. But we are the case, we are the, 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 we are the example that actually there are communities that somehow uh, interact with monuments, with archaeology, and how do we do that? For example, can we use Stonehenge for rituals or should we not? Because we ruin the monument. And so this, this tale told me, um, mentioned to me a little bit of this vibe. How, how do we deal with antiquity? How do we deal with ancient, um, ancient objects? I also noticed that in our collection, there are some very ancient objects and, and I wonder how did Doreen deal with these objects? Um, what, what idea did she have um, connected to these objects? But then the feeling is always the same, what Maggie was saying before. The, the outcome of the story is always that somehow magic wins, somehow what needs to happen happens, and in fact, the objects, the object, the, the talisman goes back to where it belongs, to the underworld, to the spirits that um, of, of those ones who produced it. Um, yes, I, I really enjoyed this. I, I, I noticed that again, she mentions specific deities showing a, a very specific knowledge. I'm not just blabbering about antiquity. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the feeling she gives, isn't it? Differently from maybe other authors. Um, she mentions a lot the, the tour, on which there are a lot of controversial studies, but you know, <laughs> Doreen was a daughter of her times. So it's absolute, we, we, we can forgive her for everything, for all her archeological interpretations. Um, yeah, I think this is this is my opinion on the tale. I'm curious to to hear yours. Wonderful, Julie. You you haven't had much of a chance to talk, so I don't want to go blabbering on. If you have thoughts, I haven't actually read it lately, <laughs> and um, I've been trying to download it from our Dropbox, and I. Uh, Adobe's not playing very well, so I can't really make a comment at the moment. Um, it's all technology getting in the way today. Oh, good. <laughs> I mean, your own personal reflections are meaningful too, so it doesn't have to be like about what happened in the chapter either. So if anything occurs to you, the glasses. Yes, well, I know that um, in her first book, Where Witchcraft Lives, she. Um, studied from Brighton, uh, Sussex Archaeological Society, and she used a lot of their research um, in and uh, quoted it in her first book about particularly um, a man called Herbert Toms, who was an archaeologist in Sussex, and um, he was, I think it was his work, where they would research witch balls on Sussex folks uh windowsills she was very very interested in in local archaeology um, and she would obviously pester them at the local library whenever she could <laughs> yes that's wonderful i'm gonna have to go back and reread that book it's been a long time yes yeah it's got a lot in it yeah I'm sure there must be some connections she does bring up in some other chapters. Yeah, uh, uh, it would be interesting to see how it all uh, interleaves from one book to the other, to the next book. And that, I haven't really looked at that either. It yes. would be interesting. The, um, Marco, you mentioned something about the, the artifacts that are recovered or discussed in each chapter. And in this one, there's a bronze pendant of the moon in the shape of of a of a crescent moon but with the with the edges looking down yeah. uh, so I, li I like the fact that she describes it so closely and it's interesting because she speaks about the moon and through this tale she 
tells a little secret. She tells us a little secret about magic. Uh, yeah. Or Christine wants to come in. Oh yes, uh, thank you. Let for her in. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, hello, Christine. Hello, Christine. Welcome. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've I've been very uh, remiss today, and I've got a lot of things wrong. We've already been chatting for a while, um, <laughs> but I, I gave you the wrong time, I think, didn't I? I'm so sorry. We're recording it anyway. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Sorry, I just realised I saw the email just then, and I've just got a bit confused. I thought it was five o'clock. Yeah. Is it okay to join now, or shall I? Yeah, no, keep come in. Yeah, is that stay. fine? <laughs> now we've got oh, you. Beautiful kitty cat. We have one for you. Stay. <laughs> okay, you're, not, you're a beautiful uh, black cat. What's what's oh, name? This is Shadow. Shadow. Oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, he's gone. <laughs> Time is somewhere. We were just discussing the chapter about the talisman of the moon, and Marco being. Mm. Um, an archaeologist was able to give us some reflections on that. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, I, ju I, I just enjoyed it a lot because I, uh, <laughs> I felt I felt much close to 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 it. Um, I was I was mentioning the fact that um, through this artifact that is the, the focus of the tale, um, <clears throat> Doreen here tells us a little bit of about magic. Because mm -hmm. when um, when Blake asks about the the creature that drugs Colin into the water, uh, where where he actually will lose the artifact. By the way, not the best practice to carry around artifacts. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> you find them and you leave them in the storage. <laughs> but no, he decided he was carrying it around and therefore he lost it when this elemental, a water elemental, dragged him into yeah. the into, into his sort of pond. Um mm. and, and and a Blake asked, well, but why? Why a water le elemental? Mm. And 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 Doreen um makes Ashton answering that possibly it's because water is connected with the moon mm. uh, and this is obviously one of the of I don't know if we want to call them secrets because we'll in 2022 mm -hmm. we've got so many publications but it's one of the learnings of of the teachings that we receive during our path and so I think she used it a little bit uh, as a as a way of teaching to the reader something about witchcraft. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. is it correct Cor correspondences? Do you yes. call them mm -hmm. correspondences? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's <laughs> these chapters are rife with correspondences, and we could make lists of them. You know, the times of day, the times of the year, what's going on with the elements in each one, all of the cautionary tales, the ethics of the craft, blah blah blah. You know, but I think in this one, it's very much like a connection between water and the underworld and mm. the moon and those three things kind of are uh are reflected in many times um, that, that whole uh water and mud you know the combination of earth and water and the uh the ways in which that can and the mound and it's like ew, mm. lots of juicy bits there the smell of decay exactly. of this a uh, strange creature mm -hmm. uh, connected with maybe a, the, the, the thought of death and, and the underworld. It's very interesting. She also, again, once again, mentions specific deities that she clearly have been, uh, has been researching, such as Hecate, uh, who was a moon god, who is a moon goddess, but also is a, a goddess of, um, I don't know if in English is correct, it's psychopomp. Is that a word you use? Sure. Yeah. So that uh, leads um, souls towards uh, during their path in the underworld. It's very interesting. Very. Unfortunately, I'm very, uh, in terms of uh, English speaking witchcraft, I'm very extremely new. So I, I miss all the right words. And uh, I, will, I, I guess I will get them during my training 
You're doing wonderfully. <laughs> I don't think you have any problems here. No, no, we, we're good here. Well, that's, this is so, um, it makes me want to go back and reread the chapter, of course, because there's so much more now that you have pointed out. But I love this talisman. I wonder if Doreen had that necklace. I'm, I'm sort of st still stuck on what you said about creating a, a, a table of correspondences. Yes, I have, um, a big, I have many of them already. <laughs> well, I'm just skimming the chapter listening to Marco speak and I'm like, oh yeah, she talks about on page 42, an abundance of willow trees here with their affinity for streams, willows, waters, moon. Oh yeah, I put that Each in the chart. Each chapter has plants. Each chapter has flowers. Uh, and definitely she knew a lot mm -hmm. about those things. I know nothing. So they just go right over my head. But I would love to track mm -hmm. that and, uh, and mm -hmm. connect them to the times of year and the elements and things that show up in each chapter. I don't know if she had that necklace, but I do. <laughs> if you want to see it. Yes. Yes, I do. I I'm going to go and get it. Oh, that's wonderful. How, how wonderful is that? Christine, we want to give you a chance to, to talk as well. Goodness. Okay. Very nice to have you join us. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I chose to, to uh, talk about the old oak chest and um, I read it ages ago and then I've read it again today because I just remembered, I thought I forgot about the group and I thought I read it just now. And it's funny, you should just be talking about the correspondences with times of year and this one, I didn't even realise that times like Christmas time. And of course, it's about the mistletoe and the holly. But then the old oak chest is such an interesting one to me because it's just like, um, I don't really understand it, I'll be honest with you. And I have to Google the, the song, the old song that, it rep that, that is representing um, the, the woman um, on, a, on a wedding day, she, she gets into the chest and then they find her years later kind of in, the, in, the, in a wedding gown dead. And, as a, and it's kind of like, I never heard of that before as a Christmas song. I just found it really bizarre. So I Googled it and then it just drew me in then a little bit about why would she write a story about that? I, I didn't really quite get it. Um, but then at the end, kind of, oh, and really talking about the correspondences and the flowers and whatever, it note, I noticed on the chest it had carvings of um, the ivy, the green man, didn't it? But it also had poppies. And poppies, they represent um, death, don't they? I, I, as far as I know, it's kind of representative to going to the underworld. And like talking of Hecate, I know one of her flowers is the poppy. And if you want to get in touch with, with, with um, I don't know, whoever's passed or wherever, it's poppy is the flower. And of course, the, the man who dies in the chest, is he kind of deserves it, doesn't he? And then you realise at the end that the woman that did it is probably a witch. And that her, well, she was a witch, wasn't she? Although it wasn't kind of set in stone. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit because, um, yeah, it's just fascinating about old um, antiques that she writes about. They, they absorb energy, don't they, over the years and the history with them and what they can still do, what they can still bring to the present, what they hold. Um, but yeah, uh, that's about, about all I can really talk about right now because it's so deep. <laughs> There's probably much more to it. I love that. The connection to song at that uh, mm. at the Christmas time. That whole I feel like that's very evocative of old, sort of ancient feelings. Mm. Even if it's mm. not really all that old, you know, a couple hundred mm. years old feels old to me because I'm an American. But um, this this whole like anytime you sing a song that somebody else sang, mm. you feel connected to their past. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. and somehow to their future. It's this whole uh, feeling of holding hands with everybody before and mm -hmm. everybody after mm -hmm. you. I love that mm -hmm. part. So yeah. starting it with that song sort of brings in the feelings of you. And then she ends the chapter with that too, right? She, she mm -hmm. uh, says that the girl that received the chest looked a lot like this lady. Mm -hmm. She, yeah. Miss Bich Bishop, has um, some connection to maybe uh, Somerset witchcraft, which of course I want to go mm. and get 
Crowther's um, book on that right now. So that's mm -hmm. Marco, do you have that necklace now? <laughs> as, as usually happens, I cannot find it. <laughs> well, maybe next time. That's I will as soon as I find it, I'll take a picture and I'll send it around because it's 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 a bronze uh, moon. And the only thing that it has got, I think it's from Africa, I'm not sure. It has got two birds on the side. And I really liked it because it looks very Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, you have these little ducks everywhere uh, connected with the sun and with the moon. So when I, when I first read the tale, I thought, the necklace looks really similar. I will send over a picture as soon as I find it. I love that. I'm um, I'm really taken by this mention of of witch's blood, this, uh, yeah. this French concept, the mm. grand sign. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think uh, this I've heard it talked about in other terms. But the, this idea of a connection point, not maybe actual blood, maybe just conceptual blood, or or. Mm. Uh, Le grand sang. Le grand sang. Mm. Which is blood. Which is blood. Yes. Whoa. And now I want that chest, of course. This uh, I would love to. Yeah. Have, even my <laughs> covetous nature as a, a, a magpie would love to have one of those. That's mm. interesting. I don't um, really want to be able to lure young men to their death. Um, that <laughs> is not my goal. Just saying that for the. <laughs> yeah. the other hello dearly i have oh, a another one. tuxedo as well oh he's gorgeous yes hello. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wants to be part of the zoom yes that's that's their job yeah. were there any other chapters that uh struck people's um, fancy i like that you've brought up that le grand song um in that story uh part of my childhood was spent in guernsey which is in the channel islands near where jersey is where le grand song where, where she mentions the, the big the witch's blood the grand song and um, there are many uh sto witchcraft stories in the channel islands guernsey from the old breton uh, tradition um and uh there are many many years um in guernsey in particular i don't know much about jersey and so um she she obviously researched that as well and looked into that mm -hmm. yeah very love to hear more about that yeah i'd like to research it a bit more uh, of course uh, guernsey and jersey have their own patois and I think that comes from the old, um, the old witches would use that patois as well in their incantations. And I don't know much about it. It stimulated me to now mm. read up mm. a bit more about it because I lived there for my, what, some of my childhood. Absolutely. What is patois, Julie? What, what is it? Patois is a kind of um, a local version of, of French. It uh, is a language. Well, it is. It's yes. It's a language, a cultural language that um, should be preserved. I don't think anyone speaks it anymore. I thought I recognised the, the term, but I didn't know you were meaning the language because patois is patois. It's spoken in Valle d'Aosta as well. We've got communities in the north of Italy, yeah. in the region towards France, and they speak patois. And I didn't realise that patois was spoken. Also not on the well, channel. It, well, it's probably a version of Italian then, Italian patois. Yeah. So this was yeah, the, French, French patois. Like a, a local dialect and like, the ways yeah. in yeah. which it might inter like, yeah. interact with the culture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you twigged a memory, Julie. I've, I've got this little book. That, oh, wow. Wow, brilliant. Who's that by then? This was written by someone called, it's one of those uh, by Sonia Hilsden. Uh, Sonia, S-O-N-I-A, Hillsdon, H-I-L-L-S-D-O-N. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whenever I travel, or my, my husband and I both travel a lot for work, and, and I, I say to, to Jeff, 
you know, if you're in a place and you find, you know, sometimes in a, a, a bookstore, a tour shop, they'll have like a local legends type book. Yeah. And he was, um, he was in Jersey because it's his family, part of his uh, family came from Jersey a few generations ago and he was there right. filming something and he brought me back this book because what mm -hmm. do you bring your witchy wife from travels but it's got some interesting little ghost stories and um yeah stories of witches from around the isle of jersey so it's uh it's a yeah. fun little book to read i don't know uh, yeah how scholarly yeah. it is but it's uh got a lot of the local lore of that of jersey so maybe there's, there's a great value uh, for me in in local um folklore and oh, yes. Well, yes one of those things that that yeah. really comes through when I travel. I wherever I try to go, I go to the small bookstores, the little kitschy shops, and yes, you yeah. can always find the most interesting books there. Yeah, I put a link to that in the in the chat. Yeah, there's uh, there's some really great photographs in here too of, you know, local local witches. Oh wow! Yeah, um, very traditional look. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's fabulous. What, what a great uh, link yeah. you have, Julie, to that. Yeah, I do. I, well, mind you, we left when I was about seven, so I don't remember much. But I had an old auntie that lived there still. Well, she's dead now, but she was in Guernsey during the occupation in the war. And um, she was a, a piano accordionist, and she used to sing in patois to... The German soldiers, so they'd feed her. I don't know what else she had to do, <laughs> but, uh, wow. um, but I I understand from stories. But they do embellish things from family stories that she would um, m make fun of them in patois when they didn't really realise what what <laughs> what they were listening to. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, it's it's an interesting. Uh, a group of islands and that they are very magical they're made of um, I believe it's a form of granite and it's got some kind of magnetism in it as well hmm. and it, you feel it you just feel the magic there I hope it's still there I haven't been for about 20 years but uh, it's still I'm fascinated by the idea that there are places where magic can be felt by so many people and where hmm. it's it's really, um, it's, it's yeah. palpable, like for people mm -hmm. who, like me, who don't generally feel that sort of thing, but can tell. I, I, I like to uh, oh, yeah. follow those currents and, and see what happens. Yes, you in can a, feel it. In a reverential way, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> of course. One of the other chapters that really uh, inspired me was, uh, or, or there, there's lots in here and, and I'm sure there will be more at the end, but I kind of stopped after Old Oak Chest. Um, um, to, or I guess I went to read the one called The Corn Dolly. The mm. Corn Dolly. That yeah. was set at the harvest, the first harvest they say. Uh, and yeah. the, the, mm. the chapter begins with a very formative moment between our two main characters, A and B, who, in which um, Blake says, do you believe in witchcraft? And I think Ashton has to kind of, I, I was really curious to see how he was going to respond because this is one of those things that there, there are, you know, there's guidance around what you say when people ask that. And I don't think he ever answered him, <laughs> um, but but he just sort of kind of walk around it. And and in yeah. previous chapters, he talks about um, like, like the one before that is the, or I guess the one after that is the black dog one, and that's the one where they have a moment with the uh, the supernatural. That's he's like, okay, you're gonna have to hold my hand for this one um, because it's going to be bad. Are you ready? <laughs> and he's right. Um, but I think the the corn dolly, it's, it's much more like Blake's own experience. And he comes back and tells the story for the first time in the, in the book. Um, and, uh, and he asks about it, about this experience of the corn dolly. Like, yeah, this is uh, maybe, dolly. you know, classic, I don't know how, how common they are, but, you know, you start the chapter with a bit of a, 
uh, apples and chrysanthemums and Michaelmas daisies and the last sheaf of wheat. And there's a lot in the Golden Bough about the last sheaf of wheat in different cultures and what that you know, means and whatever. Um, but the experience of the story of this girl who marries a ne'er-do-well and, 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 and her mother ends up being angry about it and says, I'm going to essentially use the older ways <laughs> to get revenge on him. And uh, she says, I don't need a divorce lawyer. I need my own tools. Thank you very much. Um, and she, and then Blake comes upon this, this scene uh, in which she is um, using the dolly and sticking pins in it and saying words. And, um, and there's clearly some magical link between him and the dolly. And you find out that he's got a piece of his shirt inside of it. And, um, and then later there's a vehicle crash and he is burned to death. Um, not to totally ruin the chapter for everybody who hasn't read that one, but I think um, the question turns much more towards, you know, did this really do something? And so I obviously that's really the question that, uh, that Blake is asking, is magic real? He's not really asking, is witchcraft real? He's asking, is this magic thing? Is this actually possible? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the answer is yes. But it wasn't the dolly, really. It was, it was the girl herself who did it. Yeah. And she and he goes and explains that it's not just the technical knowledge that's necessary. It is really the passion, he says, the activation energy. You know, the thing that you do needs both. And without the second one, without that will behind it, then it would never work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, I think, the lesson we get in that. I mean, not only don't marry assholes, but just also the experience <laughs> of, you know, if you want to do magic, this is what's going to happen. The mother was very clear that she was going to take on whatever repercussions this had. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we maybe have heard the story that you don't, if you're a witch, you don't do painful magic, but she is. She's doing it. She's doing it for her daughter and she would do it again. And she's yeah. taking on whatever repercussions it's going to come back on her. It's not going to be her daughter who's going to get the effects of this. We don't get to see that part of the story, but I think that that is also very clear. She's, she's going to do this. Her will plus her daughter's energy is what makes the spell happen. So the intention, the, the conviction, the, 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 It is like part of 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 uh, sort of a teaching as well. It's like it's like if Doreen is telling us to do magic, you need to do this, and uh, and I think she's saying it to the public as well, because I think this scenario is one of the most. I perceive that this is the scenario which the public might be more. Uh, used to in terms of witchcraft what is witchcraft witchcraft is something which deals with love problems in in their sort of very maybe very uh, basic idea and to speak about that very general scenario she sort of gives us some rules of how to do things and uh, well not how to and i'm not saying that during is suggesting to curse people <laughs> but she sort of um, explaining to us the mm. the dynamics, the physics of it. Yes, mm. she's trying to answer that very difficult question he asked. You know, is witchcraft real? Uh, and uh, clearly, in this book, <laughs> it's laid out. And, and how many times do you have to see it before it's real? Apparently you have to see it seven times because this is the seventh chapter. And, uh, and that's a magical number oh. too, right? You get the whole experience of how many times do oh. we need to be able to check? Ask this question again, maybe ask it again some other time, maybe next time I'll answer you. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we'll continue on this saga. I love it, like, um they're all on so it, the book can be read all these stories are on so many different levels um, and this one is obviously I'm, I'm sure she's trying to teach people 
the basic rules, you know, like be careful what you wish for and <laughs> things like that. And I'm sure she is. It's brilliant. So many levels. Yes, these little chapters. Mm. Ju yeah. Julie, can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, is... I, I might not be able to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know is... very much. <laughs> well, putting this book together, because I understand that you um, and, and your husband... I was in the editing team, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Did you put the chapters in order or were they, were they found no, like that? that was done by um, Sarah Kay, uh, who okay. was Ashley's, Ashley Mortimer's girlfriend who passed away um, tragically at the age of 26 oh, no. uh, a couple of years ago, yeah. But anyway, she did all of that kind of work. Okay. Yeah. And did she well, add it to them as well, or were they found it like this? Did she what? Did she add it them at all, or were they? No. Uh, Doreen wrote them. No, we we it, um when we inherited her folder of magical things, including Gerald's uh, book of shadows. This this was a bundle of papers typed out the mm. short stories. Um, as a manuscript and we just copied them verbatim from Doreen's words and mm. published them. I, I don't know if Doreen prescribed what kind of order they should be in. Um, I think they might. she might have put a rudimentary in, index in with a bundle of papers. There might have been one. Uh, yeah. so, yeah. uh, it seems that. to be Seems to work anyway. The order they're in, yeah, it I think it's well. a good order, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, we should probably try to verify Julie this yeah. thing with okay. the manuscript because this this would be particularly yeah. interesting. <laughs> Agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's in the Dropbox, Marco. <laughs> oh, is oh okay. <laughs> um, but obviously it's. It will require some time to. It's quite obscured. It's uh, like a yeah, yeah. cult, really. Yeah. I would love to look at it if it's available, but uh, uh, certainly I would understand if it's not. Um, I see. My problem is every time I download anything that's in PDF, which all of these are, it goes into this Acrobat thing where I have to create a user account. Um. So. I, no, don't stress I, about it. It's good. Yeah. Well, mm. I could try and do um, a screen share of one of the poems. Oh, there. Look, I can do on preview. I can do a screen. I can't scroll down. I can. Right. Let do a screen share. The talisman of the moon. Oh. Screen share screen. Right, so I'm going to share my screen, and it's there, that one. Now, can you see it? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Do I need to zoom in a bit? Yes, would you do the plus there? Thank you. A bit more. That's yes. how we got them on her old typewriter. Oh, wow. In a folder of yeah. files. Yeah. So there we are, and that's um, a PDF of it. Wow! So, All done in an old typewriter. Yeah. Yeah. Typewriter. Yeah. That's lovely. Um. So in that folder on Dropbox, I wonder if there is a rudimentary. Shall I look now, or do you want me to find it later? Like an index to look for can't do it while I'm in screen share. If she had a table of contents, I, of course, would be curious to know. Yes, of course you would. <laughs> I knew you would. Uh, so it's the witch ball and other No, I. It's very difficult. 
I'm in actual full screen mode and it's not easy either. Don't worry about it now. I think uh, it might be worth investigating though. Yeah, I wonder how, how Sarah did do that. Yeah. This is so much fun. I, I love hearing all of your yeah. connections and, and the they spark the so many of more how, for me. Yes, of how we got them. Yeah, no, that's that's the layout that Sarah did. Yes. Now I I will have to look a bit easier when I'm on my bigger computer. I'm just on my laptop at the moment. Okay, unless you can, Marco, in the Dropbox. Uh, what would you like me to look for? The scans? Yes, the scans of the things we scanned, yeah. So, which would be in the publications? Maybe I found something. No, I didn't. No, publishing, in, in publishing. Um, drop box. No. No. But we, we should look at it and uh, and yeah. find out if there was an index because obviously if it, if if we find out that this is exactly her original index, obviously there is a, another level of uh, of interpretation that we yes. can look. Yes. And if and if it wasn't. Yes. Uh, uh, if it wasn't, if we didn't have the index, but this is the the, the way which the the tails were put in order, but it's yeah. even more interesting because again, it may it makes a very strange sense as Maggie was highlighting before, um, yeah. the number seven and yeah, it exactly. is. As it if... might be quite important, mightn't it? Yeah, we need this a good question, Maggie. <laughs> This is the kind of geekery I appreciate. It's it's like, I mean, how much of it can you ascribe to the intentions of the writer? I think there can be exactly. levels of that. Like you can say, oh, it's all coincidence, but there's something to be said for coincidence as well. And I value yeah. that. I, I study that quite a lot. And, uh, yeah. and the value of somebody's inspiration to do things a certain way for whatever reason and for, you know, how hard did she have to work at this? it comes from her that's meaningful to me it comes in a particular yeah. way and i think i value that so yeah yes definitely and we might be able to find a timeline of their lives that go through this book as well ashton and blake their lives them getting older or gaining more experience maybe throughout their the timeline definitely so, yeah was, that is another level is very interesting Wow. <laughs> there are two more chapters in this book. And the next yeah. one is quite long, as penultimate chapters tend to be. And then there's kind of a wrap up about the witch ball returning. Shall we do yeah. one more meeting about this book? Yeah. Do you yeah. think? Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and our next date is Beltane. Uh, uh, yes, it is. It's so May the 1st, isn't it? We'll enjoy that uh, for whomever can make it, I think. Yeah, I don't think we should start the meeting, okay. thing, should we? Just... We, we have already picked that day and it's going to be yeah, fine. Yeah. That's true, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, the first and it's three o'clock. Yes. yes. For you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll um, do that. 17. Find... Tell, tell me the GMT, because I want to make sure I get it right. Well, my, uh, UK GMT is 3 p.m. But it's 4 p.m. for me in Spain. So that's 1500, is that right? 1500, yeah. 1500. Yeah, I was thinking 1700, but I was wrong. So yeah, well, I got I got terribly muddled today. I've, it's I've 10 o'clock for me and oh, nine for Dodie. So that's nice, I think. Um, can I ask everyone a favor? Yeah. You don't have to, um, but it would help us if you could do a, a review on um, Amazon, for example. Yes. which I can copy yeah. onto our website, on the review from our website. A review of the book, yes. Yes, yeah, that would help immensely. Definitely. 
Yeah, it's open amazing, amazing how much good reviews on Amazon helps. Uh, it is amazing. It's and luckily crazy. there's nothing but good reviews there now, but I think the more that we can have the better. I'm putting yeah, a link in the new, chat right now. Ones. So oh, just go yes. ahead and open that up in your browser. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, more up-to-date reviews help as well, don't they? Mm -hmm. Thank that you. would be another thing to talk about at our last book club meeting someday where we talk about publishing exactly. <laughs> the importance of Amazon reviews. I think that that's a topic worth bringing up at several meetings repeatedly. <laughs> it's very, it yeah. is very interesting though. What, what do we publish? Why do we, speaking about Wicca, what do we publish? Why do we publish? Who do we publish for? I mean, I talk as a, as a, as an ignorant. I'm not I'm I'm not an author at all. I'm, what I write is not is not narrative at all. But it's so interesting because everyone publishes now, and yeah, should they? That <laughs> is a great useful? question. I am putting it in a box. <laughs> I'm going to go write a blog entry right now about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's uh, uh, interesting. Yeah. I, I'm so delighted by this little group that, uh, Julie, you've inspired. Thank you so much. And oh, it was you as well. It wouldn't have happened if, if it, you weren't there as well. And We are a good team. Julie's making really good comments. It's really food for thought. Yeah, it's really brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's lots to and, be done. Oh, just another question for the end of um, the year or the end of the season um, talk with we're going to have um, for Christine. We're, we're going to have a copyright talk um, and things, uh, incidental things. Mm -hmm. um, is about translations because how did you? It, it was of an era, wasn't it? This book in particular. I don't know if people would culturally be able to relate to these two Sussex guys. Um, dealing in antiques you know if someone in brazil if you had a brazilian portuguese translation what what would they think of it and would you be able to get the different levels of understanding in it in into a translation mm. i don't know what do you think marco into italian would it work it's a very interesting question, and I'm dying to give my opinion. <laughs> I think that works like this shouldn't be just translated, no. like, like Google whatever, Google. No. no. I think there should be a, 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 an edited version, a curated version. So you, you translate the text, but you need to study it and... Yeah. Uh, and allow um, notes and comments and maybe yeah. parallelisms. I think a book like this, like many others really, like many others which has been mm -hmm. translated in Italian completely randomly, they deserve a study. Um, Wiccan texts have been translated in Italian. Mm, there is a lot of, uh, do you say it in English? Monopoly sort of? Yeah, I translate yeah. because I have got the power to do it. But in reality, yeah, no, it has been done just because because uh, there was the rush to do it. While yeah. I think, uh, I, and I can see uh, Maggie's nodding, so I, I, leave, I leave your opinions now because I'm very no, curious you, about it's it. It's a nail on the head because when we have our meetings uh, for our community here in Spain, it, they have to be in two languages. Spanish and English and then we have a, a person who translates in her head she's brilliant um, simultaneous translation but it's not a translation it's more of um, um, oh, an interpretation mm -hmm. she's an interpreter she's not a translator and mm -hmm. I think when we do these books into another language it's got to be an interpretation Mm. which adds a whole no new meaning to the whole you know the whole book and and the intent of the book maybe so you'd have to have someone who's really talented and intellectual probably to do that interpretation into another language wouldn't you yeah they need to know 
layers mm -hmm. of the I material really they need to know both languages and all the colloquialisms and on everything that all the meaning that could be conveyed by the original text mm -hmm. and how to communicate it in in the other yes. language that they're translating and i know that marco i agree with you that often translations leave me cold because they're just so poorly done it's yeah. very political it's very political and i hate that and i'm not ashamed to to voice that hate it's very political i publish because i can oh, you, yeah. you cannot really it's mm. arrogance, isn't it? There's more responsibility yeah. than that, for sure. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Absolutely. I would agree with you. Mm. That, that came up a lot in our uh, book club about uh, Aradia. Oh, yeah, of course. Because of the, the, the various translations of that and the, the ways in which the meaning, the translation has impacted the, the use of the text. Um, I'm sure you have thoughts about that, and I would love to hear them sometime. <laughs> they are not really relevant here, but I, I, uh, it, it got me thinking um, in a different way about mm. translations, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The hand we'll probably go on and on forever about this. Yeah. <laughs> please, please go, Marco, if you have more. No, no, no. It, but uh, all, all the text, the handbooks by. Our, our main uh, guides, let's say, all, all, the, all the books that really teach Wicca, it's, it's not just translating them. It really is not, I believe, but... It's an interpretation, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, the yeah. authors should be more um, ex exigent. They should require more when they, uh, unfortunately, more, most of these authors are now um, beyond the veil, but uh, at least for Doreen, well, we cannot do much for Doreen, unfortunately. We can, all, we can only look after the books we produced, but books such as The Rebirth of Witchcraft, yeah. uh, they, we, we, we don't really own the the right so we don't look after their translations and yeah and, and this is a shame um but well it's a sort of all well that's a question for the copyright meeting i think yes <laughs> as well because that's quite a, a thing with the translation it is it's into um, anyway whatever i i would love to hear more from folks who yeah practice um, their in, in other languages who, who yeah. have, they have the kind of their own ways in which they use the texts that we all talk about and, uh, and they're not always in English. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, there's lots more to be said for about that. Yes. So you can go yes. to that <laughs> All right. Thoughts about, did you, did Marco, you brought up the rebirth of um, witchcraft. Is that the one you held up there? The Let's rebirth. stop recording at the moment because yes. it's take, might be a lot of a big file. Yeah. Take care of that. Yes, let's stop recording here. How do I stop it? Oh, you can I'll, do, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> that will go into the cloud now somewhere. Mm -hmm.